Welcome back to How Would You Beat, where we discuss how you can use jobs to be done innovation methods to beat your competition. In this episode, we'll look at how you can beat your own product ideas. Can you create even better product ideas that will create even more value for your customers? And can you improve your team's product ideas in your roadmap? So this is an interesting question. How do you beat your own product ideas? So Jared, why is it important to beat your own ideas? I like that question because you would assume that you want your ideas to succeed. So why would you want to go about trying to beat your own ideas? And the the way I think about it is that lots of product teams, and I've been on a couple of them, have huge backlogs of ideas, right? You, you want to be an encouraging team member and an encouraging PM, right? You often think about it as gathering requirements from stakeholders and your colleagues. And so people have product ideas all the time. You know, everybody who's working at a company are constantly thinking about how can I improve this product? How can we improve our business? So they're constantly having new ideas. And as a PM, you don't want to shut that down because who knows? One of and those your customers great give you new ideas. That's right. Your customers give so, you tons of ideas, yeah. right? There's constantly feature requests. And so you bring all those into the backlog and you say, hey, maybe someday we could get to this. And, you know, we don't want to kill any ideas. We want to just prioritize the good ones. And eventually, like we talked to a, um, a company we worked with the other day, I think they said they had something like 1,200 JIRA issues and they had to figure out how should they prioritize that. And yep. it was because of this process. They just kept adding and adding and adding to their backlog. And the issue is that if you pick the wrong ideas from that super long list and you try to do too much, it, it could be the kiss of death. And, and Jay, I, I think that you have great ways of talking about this, right? It's it's the risk mitigation and how your product development investment is your biggest risk. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's so important is you might not also have the best idea for the time. There might be a better idea that you can do quicker and faster with lo less risk. So uh, and, and, you know, we see this on, on both directions, which is uh, you're coming up with an idea that's too simple and you need to build on it because it's not going to create enough customer value. Or the idea is so complicated that, you know, you eventually you're, – you're at the level of curing cancer to make it work. Um, and the what's fascinating about looking at this through the lens of the customer's job is there's often incremental progress you can make that is very low risk. Because first and foremost, if you understand those customers who have the most difficulty in the market today, and this is why customer effort scores and just measuring difficulty with getting the job done is, is so much more predictive of whether or not you're creating customer value. Because people are busy. People are very, very busy. And if you find those things that are very difficult for them to do in order to get a job done, and of course, you want to make sure the job is important to them, that given those criteria, where they struggle the most with the most difficulty, you might be able to get something into market relatively quickly and then build on that. And that's where you can beat your own idea over time as well. So, you know, you want to make these decisions, for example, looking at your JIRA tickets, you know, how right. do you prioritize all those? Well, maybe there's some things that are actually going to create value that you've deprioritized because they're, they might be simple or quick, but you just haven't been able to build the thesis that, hey, th this is going to create value for our customers right now. Right. And that's kind of where Jobs you Done really brings together product marketing and sales because you can get this stuff to your sales team quicker and start accelerating growth. And at the end of the day, all of this product work is to accelerate your growth. Yeah. And that is the, the key goal. Can you get stuff into the market now that can accelerate your growth? So, so on that thread, right, can we get stuff into the market now? Um, the, the counter argument of like, you should say no to some of your own ideas and you should not build everything is, is lean product development, right? Which is not necessarily suggesting build everything, but it's saying get out in the market, fail fast, learn, get more out in the market. And the question is, you know, why, why does that tactic have caveats, right? Why would, why, yes. why can we not just go wholeheartedly and, and say, let's build everything and let's just see what works. 
Well, here's is a great way to visualize that problem or the problem with that approach is someone gives you a bunch of darts and they say you should hit a target, but then they blindfold you and spin you around. Sure, you can randomly throw darts into the air, but you might hurt someone, <laughs> meaning your company and your prospects and your success. Uh and you also might randomly hit the target, but that doesn't mean that's a good method. In right. fact, there's a lot of reasons that there's this asymmetry between venture investors with portfolios of companies where they just they just care if one of them hits the target because if you hit the target, it's you know you, the the success is you know Google or Amazon, and it doesn't matter if every other dart flies off and injures other people, right? You don't care because you just made so much of your money, you wipe off the rest. But if you're an entrepreneur or if you're an executive at a company or if you're a product team or if you're a board member, you know, you have that company. Your goal is to hit the target. You don't want to randomly throw darts into the air and hope right. it sticks. Well, and to totally kill the metaphor, as an entrepreneur, you have far <laughs> fewer darts than a VC does. Right, yes. you, you only get yes. so many darts to throw as an entrepreneur, even yeah. if you're serial. Um, and so you, you better yeah. know your, where you're throwing. Your darts it. are cash. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and if you don't hit the target, you lose cash. And yeah, if you hit the target, you make cash. It's pretty simple. Right. Business is right. straightforward. If you're not generating cash, you will eventually run out of money. You know, there are capital markets right. that can sustain, you know, ridiculous valuations and rounds of financing like today, which is great. Go out there and, you know, have fun. But you at the end of the day, the companies that survive hit the target. So right. being more efficient at hitting the right target is the whole process. And so that's how you can judge your ideas. Right? If you're if you think your idea has a chance of hitting a target, well, explain why. That's the key is, okay, and is that argument not because people want technology <laughs> you know? Yeah, because they, they don't they, right. because they want your product or the worst, which is also, you know, unfortunately very pervasive in the, you know, lean movement is your customers don't even know that they need your product because they have latent needs that is if nothing else that should be that idea should be put to rest it's so insulting to real humans like somehow you're waking up in the morning and you have no idea what you're trying to do with your life until something comes along and is the savior it's it's almost like a religious conversion idea it's so crazy well not only that but would you rather go after a problem that people don't know they have or would you rather they already have the problem and you can say hey I have a solution you only have to like that then you convince them of half the thing not you know yeah. I only want to convince them of the solution not the problem and the solution right um, That's right that's right yeah and and also the confusion I think you know we've talked about this but the confusion also comes from thinking that um people want a product Right. That they all wanted iPhones instead of really recognizing that the iPhone got a ton of jobs done. All those jobs are the same. You know, we, we yeah. always reference this, but one of the greatest ads of all time was actually for the iPad when they'd really matured the, the app store. And if you look at what they were saying, every single one of those things was a stable job that never changed over time. Just the way you could do it was different with an iPad than it right. was you know, with other computer platforms. So to put a really fine point on it, you, somebody might say, oh, well, there was a latent need for iPhones and, you know, Apple tapped into that. And we're saying that's not really what's happening. There was a, an, an explicit need to, you know, create a mood of music really fast on the go to communicate with friends and family, uh, uh, you know, both in written form on the internet and via phone really reliably and quickly on the go. And there were unmet needs within those goals and those are the needs. Now, the iPhone is a solution that satisfies them incredibly well. People didn't know they, that they wanted that solution. And, and you have to make that demonstration of how that solution satisfies the needs. So how do we apply that notion to your product roadmap and beating your own ideas, right? So you've got this backlog of ideas. We've established that if you try to build all of them and you miss the target too many times, you'll eventually run out of darts no matter how low the cost of technology development is. And so you've got to pick the right ideas. So how do we do that? 
Yeah. And and this is where we've all been through these processes, these idea generation sessions before. And um, and of course, the, the traditional way is to uh, get in a brainstorming room and brainstorm ideas. And the rule of brainstorming is there are no bad ideas. Um, you know, back in the late 90s, when I was at Microsoft, we had a brainstorming room and it looked like, you know, my my children's preschool with Tickle Me Elmo and finger paints and colors and, you know, it's supposed to be the creative room and there was no bad idea. So you could come up with other whatever crazy ideas. So the the better way to do it is to figure out what your customers are struggling with. And that's basically the job as the terminology is used today. But they have a problem you need, they need to solve uh, is also another way to phrase it. And the key is that that thing is independent. So it's got a lot of variables in it. It's got a lot of criteria. If you're trying to just get to a destination on time, right? Like the iPhone was hired because it's easier to get to a destination on time with a phone that navigates you there. And that job, you can break it down like any job into a whole series of steps. And those are criteria. That's the key concept. When you're trying to beat your own ideas or you're trying to beat your competitors' ideas or you're trying to think of new ideas, that th- – what you're trying to solve for is the key. And the that's so that's the first element. The second is, of course, that your idea has to be faster or more accurate. And this, I think, is one of the hardest things about adopting Jobs to Done for teams because um, – and I think it's because we're humans and we like to build stuff. And stuff has features if you're building products today, right? Knobs and dials and options and settings and preferences. Your customer doesn't want to deal with any of that. They they want to click a button and get a job done. Now, that can be very, very hard to do. Um, but that is the goal. And that means that the criteria that you're using is speed and accuracy. You can always mm-hmm. – get the job done faster and more accurate until it's just automatically instantaneously done. Right. And that is, that's the criteria. That's how yeah. you can judge. It, your can, can you satisfy an unmet need faster, more accurately than the existing solutions available to your customers? And, yep. and so the antecedent to that is having alignment on which unmet needs you want to focus on and which customers. And, and that's how we set up our job speed on product strategy, right? So yeah. you choose a customer and you can define that customer at a relatively high level or, you know, uh, consumers, salespeople, you know, healthcare providers, uh, you know, a customer who's trying to achieve some goal. They have a goal in yeah. common. You set up your job. And then you need to figure out what are all the steps that Jay mentioned, right? There's a process that people have to go through to get that job done. There's a lot of uh, steps that go into it. Uh, There are variables that can cause uh, those job steps to go off track. You're telling the story of what the customer needs to do to get that job done effectively. So now you have your framework of a customer, a goal, and a bunch of steps they have to take. Now you need to figure out do I need to target all consumers? Do I need to target all doctors, all salespeople? Or is there a smaller group of people that I can get a toehold with really quickly because they're struggling a lot? And that that group of struggling people will be my early adopters, my, my first users that love the solution that I generate to satisfy their unmet needs. And that is what we call your target segment. So you've got a customer, a job, a target segment that struggles a lot. And most importantly, that target segment is willing to pay to get the job done, assuming that you're going to charge your customers and yeah. that's how you're going to make money. Yeah, that's great. So let's use some concrete examples because that's a lot of theory packed in there, a lot. <laughs> which is great. <laughs> and if people want to learn more about this, we have more videos and a whole bunch of stuff to explain the theory. But practically, let's let's look at some examples. Um, and I'll, I'll use myself as a customer of products. So uh, throughout my history of products, uh, it was fascinating to me why I kept buying Apple products. So my dad, you know, we we talked about this in the Apple podcast because my Mm -hmm. dad was, you know, obviously he's my hero and got me into computers back in the 70s. You know, that was pretty out of his time. And so he was a DOS guy and the Mac came out and I just was immediately enamored of it. And I couldn't explain why, but if I look back on it, it's clearly because I could get to the things I wanted to do on a computer which included learning how to program a computer mm-hmm. and write code uh, and music uh, and just a graphical interface. If you were going to record music 
on a computer, I mean, typing in commands is it's it's uh, it's almost it's I think it's literally impossible. I don't think anybody has ever built built a like command line music app. Actually, that's <laughs> not entirely true. I studied it uh, at Stanford in the '80s, and and I wrote computer music on a thing called the Play, which was this huge, uh, you know, for refrigerator size computer. Now I'm really revealing my age, <laughs> um, but you would write in code and it would output uh, music. It was pretty. It's actually pretty cool. But um, that's cool. But, you know, you couldn't do what you would do in modern day music. But then, right. okay, so why did I switch to the iPod? I had a huge CD collection. And yet I spent weekends, once I figured out that I could fit all of my CDs on a hard drive, there was a milestone at which, you know, whatever it was, 600 CDs or something could fit onto a hard drive. And and so I, I rip mix burn, right? I, I literally converted them all over to iTunes. Just on this is before the I think even before the iPod or that maybe the very very early days and then yeah. you know you switch everything to the iPod and then then I now it's all streaming I don't right. even have a, a technically a record collection right you know it's just you're you're paying into a service and you can listen to whatever song exists you know almost in the universe I mean combine it with some of the other services and you really can access just an insane amount of music and it's all because creating a mood with music it was faster. And mm -hmm. more accurate every single time, you know, right. there was a big platform change. It was much better. And you can even look at like Tesla today, right? So there, there was a segment in – back to your segmentation point, Jared. There was a segment of customers that I was in that was trying to create a mood, mood with music faster. And I went through a lot of pain <laughs> early on to use iTunes to convert my entire collection. And then – now, no one was ever going to need to do that again, right? You type in whatever song you want, it instantly you just play. Right. And that's true of so many different products. Right. And I think that key is who's going to pay for this and uh, is that group of people big enough for you to achieve your goals, right? So, yeah. and, and are they willing to pay enough for you to achieve your goals? And, and this really helps with focus, right? So if you think about... Um, if you say like we're building for everybody, then suddenly yeah. that criteria of what are the unmet needs for everybody gets really diffuse. And yeah. it's hard to say which ideas are bad because it's pretty rare that everybody has the same unmet needs. It's, it happens sometimes. And that's, you know, that's why products can take fire and, you know, get hundreds of millions of users very quickly, but that's rare. You know, even Facebook, which has a billion users today did not start there, right? They, they chose a very specific target segment of college students um, right. because they thought they had specific unmet needs that other people didn't really have and, and potentially weren't ready to adopt a digital solution that, that satisfied those unmet needs. So they went very specifically after that problem and grew over time. And so creating that focus around this segment is big enough for now and we're going to focus on their needs can really help you say no to a lot of ideas. You know, if you're targeting, if you're B2B and you're targeting an enterprise business, uh, you know, say, say companies with 10,000 employees or more, and somebody has an idea to go down market, well, is now the right time to go down market? Should you start right. targeting SMBs? Well, what are your growth goals? How much revenue do you have to generate? Can you generate that amount of revenue with your existing target segment? Or do you have to go downstream to expand your market? I think those are the key questions when you're defining your strategy. Yeah, and I think looking at some B2B examples, um, you know, Salesforce is a great example. Then when they started, they had to convince people to put their customer data in the cloud. People didn't even know what the cloud was or a SaaS application. They really had to define the industry. So what they had to do was find those customers that were willing to essentially take some risk because it was mm -hmm. risky, you know, to on-prem was like locked down by security guards and, you know, right. your data was supposedly secure. Um, they had to convince people that the cloud was a safe place to be. And so in order to do that, the, the goal was still to help them with the job of acquiring customers. It's just that those uh, initial customers of Salesforce were willing to take that risk because they saw the benefit of having this data reside in the cloud for their whole team. And they weren't willing to spend – I mean, remember, it was a huge industry to install, you know, a CRM system like Siebel, it, it, and it could right. take years. And it was always behind schedule and over budget, you know. 
And th- this is why this is why interestingly, Salesforce's first marketing campaign was no software, because they realized that the target segment that they the only people who were going to switch to acquiring customers to an online SaaS were people who were were so fed up with trying to use software um, that they were they were willing to do it, and that's a great segmentation. You know, method. Now everybody has to follow that, right? I mean, who's, yeah. I mean, I guess there's still some on-prem systems, but you know, basically everything's moving to the cloud because right. you and you can predict that because no one wants to get the consumption jobs done, which is install software. I mean, now right. we just, uh, you know, I I'm definitely old enough. To have been through some technology cycles. Installing a SCSI drive. Right on your computer. If anybody remembers what this goes I, I actually don't know what that is, but yeah, maybe no, I don't need to. <laughs> painful parts of my technology experience. Uh, but but literally formatting a drive and, and having it show up in your computer was insanely hard. And then like you had to install the software, and that was a whole other thing. And now, of course, you just you know you click a button and you're there. You don't even install yeah. anything; it's through a web browser. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think it's you know, and that that segmentation exercise that Salesforce did is straight out of the disruption playbook, right? You go after a low cost segment, uh, you create a product that's good enough for them um, that takes less time to get involved with uh, and start using. It's not as robust as the incumbent is that SQL Systems yep. is for the really sophisticated customers. But over time, you add to getting the more of the job done. You add the features and functionality that uh, a more robust customer would need, and you overtake the incumbent. It's straight out of the, um, the the disruption playbook. Yeah. And that's a great point to bring up disruption in the idea that you can beat your own product ideas, um, where y- you might think that beating your own product idea is is just curing cancer. Like you have to create the optimal machine learning algorithm. Um, it's, it's interesting. We see this with a lot of companies where, yes, machine learning and AI can be very powerful because it helps make decisions faster. It helps get the job done faster, especially in complex situations. But you don't have to start there. Everybody has this you know, expectation that machine learning tomorrow is going to be 100% accurate instantaneously all the time. It's like we already have you know, Turing-level artificial intelligence, which we don't. That's very, very hard to do. Um, so what what you can do is, and this is what disruption theory shows you, is you can pick a segment that has a lot of difficulty in some dimension. They, they might not be, as you say, the large enterprise customers who are going to pay a ton of money, but it's a large market. It's a large segment. And this is what Jobs Done can really do is identify these segments and say, OK, let's go after that because we don't need to deliver them Turing-level AI. We just need to help them get those job steps done better. And that's it. Right. And right. let's do that. And then we'll come into a system. And there are lots of other considerations. You know, people have you know, different systems and data warehouses and all sorts of things. But given that uh, there's a lot of communication between applications and data you know, through APIs and whatever, you can do that. So you, you then get into the market in, in essentially what doesn't look like a full suite of products, exactly like how Salesforce started. You know, and it doesn't look like Siebel. It's worse. That's the idea behind disruption is that a new product comes in that's actually worse than the leading contender. Um, but it also does compete on a, a lot of dimensions that are valuable, like yeah. not having to install software. Yeah, I think one say the way to say it's worse is it gets less of the job done, but it gets un- needs in the job done that the incumbent may not. Google yes. Sheets is a great example of that, right? Google Sheets yep. got into the market and it satisfied collaboration needs and various project management and other jobs you would do with spreadsheets. But it was way less effective at uh, statistical analysis and financial analysis jobs um, that Excel was quite good at. So it got let fewer jobs done on that platform, um, but the needs it did satisfy, it satisfied them uh, light years faster, more accurately, literally. Yeah. I think they actually, I think, I think Google Docs and Excel, you actually are collaborating faster than the speed of light because of the way they set that up. Um, uh, well, that's so much better than, than trying to do that That's a whole other discussion, but yeah. technically not faster than the speed of light. <laughs> not to deviate yeah, I think into they physics. actually fake it out. Um, I, I read a <laughs> super interesting article about this once so that they like fake out an atomic clock by setting them differently. I, I, it's, I don't remember <laughs> the details of this. Yeah. Um, but it makes it feel like you're it's instantaneous when it's actually not 
Yeah. In any case, it's it's a different dimension of the jobs um, than the incumbents satisfy. And so that's yeah, the I next think, part, right? Yeah. Like once yeah, you no. have that segment and focus, which needs are you going to get laser focused on? And you can figure that out by looking at which steps in the job we want to target or which jobs we want to target or our segments struggling with more than uh, the rest of the market. Yeah, and that I think laser that's, focus is a filter. Yeah, go ahead. yeah, and that's fantastic. And the, and you're right. I mean, it was uh, Google Sheets and you know Google Docs was disruptive in the sense that it wasn't as full featured as Word, uh, but it's classic. You know, Word and Excel were overserving the market. So very mm-hmm. expensive, very high end, incredible number of features, and a huge part of the market was like, wait, I just want to collaborate on some text. <laughs> Literally, like I don't care what it's formatted yeah. like, right? Just I need my team to collaborate on this document where we're trying to communicate, and uh, it did a better job on that because that was that was actually the area of Google's expertise is in the cloud, just being able to do everything from the ground up in the in the cloud. Right. Uh, in fact, Google's only applications are browsers. I mean, you know, they're obviously um, Android apps, but you know, they're not making enterprise. Uh, on device, uh, you know, PC based apps, it's all in the cloud. And, and so I think that is, the key is knowing which dimensions you're going to improve your product on. And Mm -hmm. that's what I think is where if you try and beat your product um, in the in the theme of, you know, today's episode, if you're doing that, you need the what dimension, what criteria are you using to decide if your new idea is going to beat your existing idea or your competitor's idea, right? It's the process is the same. And the goal is that you do that for everything in your roadmap and you have the thesis that says, this is going to accelerate our revenue growth. Because at the end of the day, and this is one of the things we see with product teams a lot, is product teams are responsible for revenue. They're not, they don't have quarterly numbers. They don't, they don't, uh, think about revenue in a quarterly basis or even an annual basis. They think about you know product success, but the goal of the product team is really to be empathizing so much with the customer that when the product comes out, the sales team doesn't have to do much. People just there's so yeah. much demand for it because it's really overcoming a difficulty. It really is a different way of getting the job done that people are very happy with and. And, you know, emotionally, we always think about this as going from confidence or moving from anxiety to confidence so that you want your customers to just, they can't let go of your product because it helps them in a situation where the job's important to them. It doesn't matter if it's parenting or consumers or B2B or medical, you know, I mean, we're in all in the middle of a pandemic, right? So yeah. There's just so much anxiety on a daily basis. And if you really can figure out that dimension that you're going to satisfy, you're you're in a much better situation. Right. So you can think about that dimension as what are the job steps you're going to target with your strategy and then just use that as a filter for everything in your backlog. And now yeah. instead of, you know, I, I love the the groom the backlog term because I'm like, it's so, it's so like subtle, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to groom it a little bit. I I think you should mow the backlog. (laughs) Like you should run it through that filter, just chop, like separate the wheat from the chaff, like get rid of a ton. And then you'll have those key ideas. Now you need to figure out, are they going to deliver value against those job steps? You have to compare them to the existing solution, that whole speed and accuracy conversation. Are they faster and more accurate than what customers are trying to do today to solve the problems in those job steps, overcome those obstacles to get the job done? Once you've run that filter through them, you then may find that there's tech debt you have to solve, infrastructure you have to deal with, bugs you have to fix. But then those all become table stakes, dependencies, if you will, to uh, satisfying those key unmet needs, to improving your product on those key dimensions for your target segment. So you have a a much much tighter constraints about what you're going to do and what you're going to not do. And I think we've seen this be successful with a lot of teams we work with. You know, it just helps them kind of, kind of just get through the noise, right? Find yeah. the signal in their backlog. Yeah, that's great. Because even with things like tech debt, like which tech debt do you want to? Everybody's got tech debt. So, yeah. and and I think you're right. The signal, the noise, just you know, because 
uh, we're all using these incredible tools today. You know, there's a lot of product road mapping tools. There's a lot of um, task management. You know, Jira obviously is kind of the dominant platform for software development. Uh, but you know, ADO and other uh, platforms. And I think you're right. It's it's where is the customer in all that? Like mm-hmm. that is – that's the signal and what you want is to make sure that whether it's your ideas or your backlog of issues uh, or your tech debt, that your customer – this is what being customer-focused really means, is that your customer is in those conversations. It's uh, it's unfortunate that it's called product management and product innovation, <laughs> Right, <laughs> because it should be called customer management and customer innovation. Yeah, customer because, value delivery. <laughs> yeah, customer value delivery. Something that's. I mean, we need some marketing help, but uh, <laughs> you know, something. It is about customer value. That at the end of the day, that's why companies are successful, and that's why they fail. You know, uh, Clay Christensen, of course. You know, uh, rest in peace. Who uh, was obviously the you know big proponent of Jobs to Be Done. Uh, and we recommend his books to everybody. Uh, the, the idea that your customers are not buying your products, they're hiring them to get a job done is the, the core, just like foundational idea. Um, but the, there should be the flip side that people remember. They will fire your product <laughs> and they have throughout history. The one thing that yes. customers do, that people do, is they fire the old products. No one's riding a horse and buggy. No one's using a paper map to get to a destination on time. Very few people are pulling out their vinyl records, <laughs> That's, right. you know, maybe for an emotional job. Um, so, you know, in all, no one is, you know, very few people are taking photos of their family with film and developing mm-hmm. film, right? You know, uh, I don't think anybody's using a BlackBerry. Um, so the, all of those are examples of getting fired, and that's the other thing that you want to prevent. So you may think your ideas are great. So BlackBerry, I'm sure, had a great set of ideas to improve their keyboard device. They were all, all the wrong ideas. Yeah. Like literally every single one of them didn't matter at all because they had fundamentally not grasped that they were being hired as a device to get multiple jobs done. So they needed to continue to improve the platform at the platform level. And th- those right. are those are the like earth shattering, you know, kind of humongous markets uh, where you're building that level of platform. Um, but for, for most companies, you know, you can just focus on a few of the customer's job. You don't have to have this, you know, universal platform like a, a phone. Yeah. Uh, but the same, the method's the same. Yeah. I think it's great. And so how do you beat your own ideas? You get a strategy in focus that's focused on your customers. Identify that target segment, know what their unmet needs are, what is the job they're trying to get done and what are their obstacles, and then make sure you don't have anything on your backlog that's not focused on that. Um, Get laser focused on it. Yeah, that's a great place to end. So thanks, everybody, for listening. Hopefully you'll join and subscribe. Uh, check us out at thrv.com if you want to learn more. Take our free course. Uh, get our ebook all about jobs to be done.